So after a very interesting uh, Christmas in Portuguese Mozambique, which was still a colony in the 1960s, and um, under Portuguese, uh, some very oppressive Portuguese rule, uh, as was Rhodesia at the time, was under a fairly, by comparison, benevolent British overrule. Uh, it was Rhodesia and it was only declared um, an independent nation of Rhodesia uh, by Ian Smith uh, later, but I'm, I think it might have been 65 that it was declared uh, an, an independent country and refused to undergo the decolonization process that the rest of British Africa was undergoing. Uh, so that was Rhodesia. But in the 60s, it was still a British, in the early 60s, still a British colony. So um, coming back to Bechuanaland, land, in early 1964, uh, I recollect having spent time over Christmas and New Year's in Byra, what was then called Lorenzo Marx, what is now uh, Maputo, the capital of Mozambique, uh, and also in uh, Johannesburg, where I spent some time, I guess in January, staying with Adam Cooper and his family who were in, uh, in Johannesburg. And Marie uh, decided at that point that um, she had spent three or four months in the bush, in the field, and uh, she was a real good trooper there. But um, in those days, it was very easy to get a job. In the, if you were Canadian, you could get a job in London, you could get a job in Johannesburg. It wasn't uh, a big deal. So she decided to get a job and spend the next few months in Johannesburg and we were going to reconvene in May uh, or June of 64. Um, Sue Buckland had uh, a project, I think it was going to be her master's uh, thesis, to do a study of the rock art of the Sodilo Hills. And the Sodilo Hills, much later, in the, I think in the 90s, was declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But in the 60s, it was still pretty much off the beaten path, with one exception. And that is the famous Lorenz Vanderpost had written a, a book called The Lost World of the Kalahari. And in it, he devoted a chapter to the, uh, which was entitled, as I recall, The Spirit of the Slippery Hills. I don't know where that came from. But he had been to the Sedilo Hills. And so, uh, but it was known uh, throughout Southern Africa as a very famous site for rock art. And so Sue wanted to uh, do a study of the rock art. And I thought, well, for me, I could go there because there were Jeune Kwasi living at the foot of the hills, and I could just do continue my work on subsistence with this other group of Jeune Kwasi. So that was the plan, and we spent uh, what turned out to be six weeks in the Sudilo Hills area. So I thought this could be really exciting for me as an anthropologist because everyone assumes that the living Bushmen of the area, that it was their ancestors who painted the, you know, paint, did the paintings. So we spent, um, weeks walking through the hills and Sue uh, developed an inventory of sites and I think she uh, we would go to a site and she would uh, 
do a sketch, a rough sketch. There's three animal figures over here. There's four human figures here. There's some geometric lines here. And then th that would be site number 21. Then we go to site number 22. And I was plotting these on a map of the, of the area of these hills. And um, so the work was going very well. Um, and there were days when she just went out with Enoch Tabiso, and uh, I think we had hired another interpreter at that point. So uh, I thought, well, I'm going to work with the Junquasi. So uh, with great excitement, I got the Junquasi to um, the Junquasi to go with me to some of the sites and um, uh, say. Okay, uh, what do you make of this site? What do you make of the? Tell me what you see in these pictures, and they uh, the answer came back like, these are ancient things that we know nothing about, and then I remember challenging them and saying, but everyone thinks that these pictures were made by your ancestors, and they were very. Um, adamant that, no, the, these, these had nothing to do with us. And um, I remember, you know, vividly one of the answers after I was pressing several times, uh, one of the spokespeople for this village, Juntois village, said, look, our ancestors taught us how to hunt, and so we hunt. Our ancestors taught us how to, what plants and foods to eat. And so that's what we eat. Our ancestors taught us the healing dance, so we practiced the healing dance. And if the they had, if our ancestors had made those pictures, don't you think they would have told us about them? But they didn't tell us a thing. So I thought that's pretty, pretty definitive answer that they didn't, uh, they didn't like it, um, that they didn't know it. So I. But one of the my favorite examples is. Uh, one famous site in Cedillo has, uh, I've taken pictures, this would be a good one to get the photograph because this would be great. Uh, I call it seven phallic figures. So they're seven stick figures and out of each one about uh, groin level there's an enormous phallus sticking out uh, and they're all facing in the same direction except one I think his phallus, or what we thought was a phallus, was facing in the other direction. So I said, uh, I learned that they were very, this was when I was still, I was still not convinced that they didn't know something. So I said, okay, uh, what do you make of these pictures? The, what I label the seven phallic figures. Um, and they, say, they said, well, we don't know anything about this picture. So then I'm getting a little desperate. So I said, okay, let's get started. Are these male figures or female figures? And so they said, well, it's clear they're female figures. And I'm looking at this giant phallus. And so I said, well, if these are female figures, what's that? And they said, well, that's obviously the digging stick. The woman has her digging stick. Uh, sticking out, she's going that way, and the digging stick is sticking out of the back of her pack. And so I said, "Okay." <laughs> so I st I think I've been uh, defeated. <laughs> They've got the better of me. I can't. Uh, but I I love the fact that uh, everyone who saw it saw them as male, and the these Junquasi uh, said, "Oh, they're clearly female figures," you know. Uh, so. That was the uh, the Cedillo trip, and um, it turned out that the Junquasi who were there, uh, a small group, maybe a dozen people, were kind of in thrall to the local Mamakushu headman, who is uh, whose name, as I recall, was Samo Chow and who was also mentioned by name in the Lawrence Vanderpost book. I came there in 64. I think his field trip was in 57. But Vanderpost, even though he is 
perhaps the most famous interpreter of the Bushman culture to the world, and he's done uh, TV series and so on. He's, uh, uh, you know, he's generally regarded as a hopeless romantic and not really a particularly reliable source of information. And I don't think he ever claimed to be anything other than uh, an interpreter of their culture, you know, their mythology. He's much more of a literary figure than he is of a, uh, an anthropological observer. So there was that. But he wrote about Samo Chow, the headman, the Mamakushu headman. And so uh, after six weeks, Sue Buckland and I and our small crew left. And I think at that point, Sue uh, got back to uh, Livingston, Zambia, and then flew back to the United States and um, left me uh, a copy, like the carbon copy of her field notes, which I still possess, uh, of all the drawings and the sketches. And I think there's something in excess of 50 different sites that she sketched. And um, that work, um, remains largely unpublished, although if years and years later she published it, I'm not aware of it. Uh, so it's an unfinished business for sure. And then um, in the middle section of 1964, uh, I began to sort of accelerate my research. I was getting a bit of confidence in the language and so I spent a lot of time uh, working on a variety of different topics which I could switch to. Uh, today I'm going to work on religion. Tomorrow I'll work on kinship. Uh, Friday I'm going to work on uh, go back to subsistence. And so I think back on that as a very productive, intense time. time. And... Um, uh, you might say, well, you've been sent out by an archaeologist and a physical anthropologist. Why are you studying religion? And um, I thought, well, you can't really do a social anthropology study, even if you're ecologically oriented, without looking at the full range of culture. And so it was clear to me that uh, religion was an, a critical part of it. And interestingly enough, I believe, if I remember correctly, the first two articles that I published based on my fieldwork, one was called Transcure of the Kung Bushman, and I think that was published in Natural History magazine around 1967 or 68. And uh, that was, uh, so in fact, the very first articles I published were on Kung religion. And then uh, later I started writing extensively about ecology and subsistence. Um, so the, it, I, my thesis was beginning to take shape in the uh, middle of 1964. So I wrote my supervisor, Washburn, and sent him a long, detailed letter. I've got information here. I've got information there. I've got information here. What advice do you have for me to how I can shape this into a thesis? And I remember his re response, which came weeks and weeks later. And he said, um, he said, Dear Richard, uh, in response to your query, I think you're the man on the scene. You have the best, uh, not, best sense of what will make a good thesis. So far from me to sort of give you any, you know, suggestions. It all looks good to me. So that was his, his way of saying it's your, it's your baby. And um, so the um, next thing that uh, happened in that year of first year of field work was, I think it was in September of 1964, the DeVore family came back. Uh, they had gone and he had spent the, he had left in September of 63 and then a year late, 
picked up his uh, job at, as a professor at Harvard, and then a year later uh, came back to Africa with his uh, wife and kids. So from September to December, it was DeVore and Lee and Nancy DeVore and uh, their kids who were, you know, who were raised. Claire is, the daughter's name is Claire DeVore. She's now in her late 50s. Uh, then she was a little girl, like three or four years old. And Greg was her older brother who, pa who passed away prematurely uh, in his 40s. And he was probably about seven or eight at the time. So they were like kids having a dream childhood, just uh, exploring the, uh, you know, this environment. And because they were anthropologists' children, they seemed to take to it very well. So another kid might have been in culture shock, but they were very sort of, they took to it very well. And then in the 80s, when I began going to the field with my own children uh, on several field trips, uh, I was happy that my own kids took, took, took to it in a very similar way, seeing it as an exciting, uh, my, I still remember my four-year-old daughter, Miriam, who is now uh, in her 30s, um, playing, teaching the kids, girls her age, hand games. And then they, in turn, were taught her their hand games. So it was like a wonderful uh, play, you know, global playground experience that these uh, Junquois kids had their own hand games, uh, the Canadian kids had their hand games, and there was an exchange without any common la language in common. So but that's, uh, that's fast forward. And so the divorce came. And Nancy DeVore was very interested in uh, women's issues like reproduction, breastfeeding, birth, pra birth practices, pregnancy pra practices during pregnancy. So by that time, I was my, I've been there a year almost, and I was able to uh, be her interpreter and with the help of Hakikoshi. So between Hakikoshi and I, uh, the, the questions were asked, and uh, the answers came back. And I was just rummaging through my field notes, and I found like a 30-page transcript of, not of Nancy's field notes, but since I was there, uh, I don't know where Nancy's field notes are, but hopefully they still exist. But I, I was interviewed somewhat like this when I came back to Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1965 to take up my first job. Uh, I was interviewed by a, a educational development uh, entity and you know I gave uh, pages and pages of notes about what I l had learned about birthing practices, pregnancy practices, sexuality, breastfeeding and so on. And so DeVore, for his part, was very interested uh, in hunting. And um, so one of the best uh, moments that DeVore and I had is uh, he was very excited about going out hunting with the men. And because I, by that time, spoke the language, we had several very memorable hunts uh, with the men. In fact, well, on one of these hunts, we both had our cameras. Um, we took photographs of the men hunting. Uh, on the cover of Man the Hunter, which is our first book published in 1968, there's a picture of two hunters uh, with um, game, small game slung over their shoulder, heading into the sunset, and that's the cover photo. But I can't remember if it was divorce photo or mine. Probably his. Uh, and so he was working on hunting. Uh, Nancy was working on these uh, women's practices. I was continuing my own uh, research uh, on four or five different fronts, including kinship. And then one interesting footnote, uh, DeVore died recently, I think in 2014. 
and at a memorial service for him a year or so ago, um, he was a person who lived, uh, who worked on the cusp between social anthropology and physical anthropology, and one of his greatest loves was pet, keeping animals as pets. And so throughout their field work, people brought baby, not baby giraffes, but baby um, bush babies. They're little primates, tiny little primates with big eyes. Uh, and they're prosimians in the prosimian family. He is a primatologist. And so he actually uh, got ba uh, bush babies, as they're called, Galago senegalensis, I think, and he actually brought one back to uh, Cambridge, Mass., and one of his best things, he would say, now we're going to talk about uh, the history, the paleo uh, history, paleontology of the primate, uh, of the primates, the closest relatives to man. He would reach into his jacket pocket and pull out this bush baby, and, you know, for that and other reasons, he was the star lecturer uh, in anthropology at Harvard for 30 years.